Welcome to our Emmaus Family Home meeting for November, and we are really excited today to hear from Alan and Brian Carroll, and they are in San Francisco, and I am going to read their bio real quick, um, just so everyone can get familiar with them. Brian and Alan Carroll live in the heart of San Francisco and love the city in almost every way. They regularly seek out new exhibits or restaurants to visit and appreciate the enriching childhood their two boys, age 14 and 10, have experienced growing up in the city. That sounds like an adventure. Alan is an entrepreneur and is currently working as the chief technology officer of the mortgage lender, Loan Snap. Brian left working as a pharmacist years ago to homeschool their boys, which has been a rich educational experience involving museums, exploring, interactive learning, and deep friendships with diverse families. In Alan and Brian's varied church service, they've strived to create inclusive, supportive ward families among the range of members within San Francisco. Joining Emmaus has particularly been a gift for broadening their awareness of how to cultivate an inclusive community for LGBTQ members. Alan has often worked with youth in the church and is currently serving as bishop. Brian has most recently served in the stake primary and early society presidencies and is now a counselor in her ward primary presidency. We are so grateful and excited to have you, you guys here. Um, we'll let you go ahead and share your story with us and then we can uh, leave a few minutes open at the end for questions if anyone has any. Great, thanks for having us. Thank you. I think I'm gonna jump in first. Um, this is an unusual position because I've been used to being on the listening end. Um, so I'm an ally and I would really love any feedback tonight if I say anything that's insensitive or offensive because I'm still learning and trying to understand. And I certainly would be very sad to have that be an outcome, but I'm wanting to learn from it if that's the case. So I grew up in Salt Lake and you might um, expect a certain outcome from that, a certain kind of experience, but it actually was pretty different than the norm. My parents had really diverse childhoods. One left LA at the age of 12 and moved to rural Georgia during the civil rights movement. And they were very supportive of the black community there. And then my dad spent his high school years in Japan so they were very open-minded people. And ironically, I think maybe that instilled in me just an interest to be around a variety of people that weren't cookie cutters of what I was like. So every single one of my friends growing up, which I didn't realize until I was an adult, was someone very different, you know, from an immigrant family or um, a very politically active Democrat, Baptist family, I mean, the whole range. And actually the only friend that I had that was a member actually came out as gay in college. So she wasn't even necessarily the norm at the time either. So um, I really appreciated the variety of people that I met in, in my childhood. And um, even though I didn't know anybody who was gay growing up, I, I just felt like we're all people and that that's common ground enough. Um, when my first introduction to someone who was gay was when um, my mom actually took me to visit a cousin who was in his 20s. And sadly, he was in the end stage of AIDS. And I just felt um, even more admiration for my mom for taking me to visit someone where there wasn't as much known about AIDS at the time. And she was just there as a family member supporting this family member in such a hard circumstance. And it didn't matter to me how that cousin got to where he was, but just that he, the tragedy of his dying so young. Um, but I really admire that she was teaching me how to be with people and how to be present. And it didn't matter our, our differences that were just connected as, as humans in this journey that we're all on here together. 
during my college years, I had some friends and relatives who came out as gay within the church and also outside of organized religion. And the ones who were within the church had all served missions. And I just really empathized with their conflict of trying to find how to meld their faith with what they were experiencing at the time. I felt frustrated um, without having more answers, which is still in ways how I feel. But I remember not wanting them to have to choose between these two meaningful parts of their lives. I went to college in Seattle and then landed in San Francisco. And both of these places to me were really healing because they the people there just represented the rainbow of all kinds of people, including at church. And I feel like that's the ultimate of God's desire is for us to each fulfill who we are and to become as different as we might be, but that that's what's the most glorious thing is for all of us to authentically and proudly be who we are. So I felt um, in San Francisco and Seattle, like it was a really safe, comfortable, peaceful place because I felt like so many of the range of who God's children are were represented there. And I especially felt that when I was serving in our stake and we have different language units, so Spanish and Samoan and Mandarin. And I just loved interacting with um, all those people, even with um, translators in some cases, but it's just that's who we are as as God's children. And it's wonderful to all be a, a part of this journey together with Christ at the center. So it was in this setting that I met Carson. I was a part of the state council. And for about six months, our state presidency was inviting us to learn how to minister to people better. We are really good in the church at ministering to people who have had babies or who've had a death in the family, but they really wanted to focus in on longer term ministering um, to especially people within the LGBTQ community. So a lot of what we did was just listen to brave people tell their stories. And Carson was one of those. And I was really grateful that they were willing to share their heartaches and what they had learned in being in the church at that time and how they felt like they could be served better. So Carson invited me to attend Emmaus and it's just been a wonderful space for me since. I've really strongly felt the spirit for the mission of this group. And I'm really grateful for everyone who shared their story and the courage that they have in doing that. It's more powerful than you can know as an ally to hear your words and that it does help bring understanding and compassion so we can spread that to our individual wards. Um, as an ally, I feel like I have big intentions, but a pretty small capacity, unfortunately. I think that's something that people can relate to though. Um, day to day, we may not have the capacity to do what we want and to make the impact we do, but even starting with little things um, can help us feel like we're moving in the right direction. So I just wanted to share some things that I've learned. Um, as an ally, I've learned that it can be helpful to make your heart known to your bishop and to your leaders so that as you're needed, you can be um, a resource of kindness and help to anyone in your ward. Um, that we can be willing to make small efforts, even if they seem inconsequential. Um, that as an ally, I'm usually more in the position of just listening so that I can be in a place of learning and understanding. But I have recognized just naturally in conversations, the opportunity to speak up where I can support people in the LGBTQ community and share a little bit about their journeys that I've heard and spread that compassion that hopefully people will hold on to more. Um, what I hope as an ally from our LGBTQ siblings is to be patient and kind because um, we might say things wrong or especially um, 
just really make a mistake in, in what we say, but I would rather know about it than um, to have someone hurting and to continue on in the way that I was before. In Within the city of San Francisco, I've learned some things about building an inclusive community. And I felt like one of the most important things is to encourage a relationship with Jesus Christ because we're all on pretty different journeys and they will look different and we don't need to analyze those as not being spiritually grounded just because it looks different than our journey. So I feel like um, Sitska mentioned this recently about um, there might like in general conference be broad revelation shared, but some of the time apostles aren't meaning for that to be taken without further thinking of individual circumstance that we can be prayerful and receive a message that's catered just to our own situation. Um, I really appreciate here recognizing our wards as a family experience instead of a social experience. We naturally become friends with certain people, but the more we're in our ward settings that we reach out and befriend and connect with people who aren't our natural friends. Um, we can feel loved and served and supported as a ward family more than just pockets of friendships. I've really loved in our stake the visual representation of who's in our demographic here in San Francisco. So I feel like when um, people can be in callings that are visible, um, whether they're an ally or a part of the LGBTQ community, it's it really changes the sense of inclusivity of the ward. I love when um, a Relief Society presidency thinks about ministering assignments as an opportunity to make connections and be disciples instead of just who might be naturally friends with each other. It seems like in different wards I've been in that, you know, <clears throat> like young moms might be put together or people that even live in the same part of the city. But as we make more connections with service in mind, I think it's really powerful how we can reach across what sometimes are barriers, but really don't make sense to be a barrier when we're all on this same journey. And um, one piece of advice that I got from a state president was to tithe our time. So I think about that with individuals in our ward that we can set aside time to think about who might feel marginalized and think of specific ways that we can serve them and help connect them to more ward members in the community so they feel a part of our ward family. But I love being on this journey and being a part of Emmaus. It's been really touching in my life. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to share a little bit too about my my journey and also um, some of how I think about uh, our ward and, and some of the things we're trying to do to be more inclusive and more welcoming and uh, be a place where everybody can come and really enjoy the gospel. Yeah. So, you know, I guess obviously I, I, though I am the Bishop of the Bay Ward, I, I speak just as as my own opinions and not necessarily as anything for the church or, or for you know, uh, as, as a bishop, I guess, but it's a unique uh, position I've been in. And I feel a great kind of uh, weight of, of tradition of the Bay Ward. You know, it's a, a unique position in the church to be in, in this part of San Francisco as part of the LGBT community here. And the long history that the Bay Ward has that I've learned more and more about uh, for many decades, actually, of, of being a, a great inclusive place for people to come and um, feel welcome and just accepted and and to be able to continue that legacy is something that I, I definitely feel uh, really strongly about so i guess you know a little bit about about my context and where i come from brown shared some about her family and upbringing and i think families uh, have a lot to do with with where we come from and our context in life and so kind of a little bit about about me i'm the oldest of six six kids in a, 
a fairly traditional Mormon family up until a bit. Had some pioneer ancestors on both sides. One of my family, besides the family, super traditional family came from Wyoming and Vernal, Utah. And uh, the other side was, uh, we'll say, untraditional, uh, even though from Salt Lake, um, you know, my grandpa lived in, in President Monson's ward right across the street from the church. But never actually went to the church. Uh, you know, was friendly with people, but didn't, you know, felt like it was uh, a good place and did good things. But he spent most of his time studying the Bible and, and sending letters to people around the world that he felt like he could help and influence for, for the good of the world. So you know, a very different take than, than most. And then kind of want to talk most about experiences I had in, in high school. I moved to Alabama when I was in middle school. And that was a very formative kind of tumultuous time for me. A lot going on um, that formed a lot of the, the ways and and th learned a lot of things that I, I take and hold dear now. So my parents um, split up when I was when I was in high school. Um, and I learned kind of a lot from that. They both remarried fairly soon after. One married uh, a Southern Baptist, a lady of Southern Baptist. And well, maybe Southern Baptist. Also, Alabama football was a religion there. And so uh, you know, choose one, maybe both. Um, so I had kind of a new and unique experience with that. And my mom married a man who was Buddhist and uh, had some, you know, taught a lot from that. I think uh, the, some of the things I learned was uh, to find friends and learn from people who may be some of the unexpected place, kind of always be looking to what you can learn from people. When we moved there, uh, my mom always has a tradition kind of a finding friends that will be people to learn and, and grow from rather than people that are like her. So instead of, becoming closest friends with all the young moms. And she found a lady who uh, lived on the other side of the tracks, I guess, if you will, she was married to a man that was black and had was part of that community. And so my mom would load up the six kids in, in the van and go in, into that community. And uh, that lady would watch out for us in a way that kind of we became part of her community too and got to meet a lot of really unique and interesting people and learned a lot from it. It was kind of a, a thing I fondly remember uh, after my parents split up and, and my mom remarried, I, my stepdad, we went to a 10 day silent meditation retreat and when I was 15 and kind of got dumped into this very, uh, say, intense experience uh, as a teenager, but also you know, learned a lot from it about uh, life and how things change over time and um, just got a, a unique grounding there. I think. Um, Another thing, just kind of being introduced to their worlds in, which was very different than the worlds that I've been in in before, as a young person, kind of uh, very different viewpoints, like I mentioned. Um, but just how many different ways of looking at the world and how many different feelings people can have was unique. I, I remember a story now about my my sons. They're both in gymnastics, and really enjoy it. About five years ago, they were at a gymnastics event where they all got together with the teams and like all the gymnasts. So they're you know, hundreds of people there at this thing. And uh, my younger son was four or five at the time, and he got out and did his routine, and everybody cheered, and he thought it was the greatest thing ever. You know, the girls' uh, gymnastics team thought he was the cutest thing, and they all kind of gathered him in as their mascot, and they took pictures with him, and he was just living it up. My older son's a little bit more shy and quiet, and he just about died inside when he saw that. He was like, I would never want to do that. That's, you know, embarrassing, Dad. Um, but just kind of that remind me of, of how yeah, different the way that we feel about a similar event can be and, and that, you know, uh, learning that the way that I perceive it is definitely not the way that everybody else does. And so coming into this, this community, that's been a, a big lesson for me. And I take some of these things and, um, you know, think about the kind of, of community and experience in our Bay Ward. Um, in, in leading, I was called to be the bishop in October 2020, so right in the middle of COVID. Uh, it was a very small ward at the time. A lot of people had left, and we were kind of rebooting, if you will, and it gave us a unique experience to kind of recreate uh, culture and uh, very focused on openness, and everyone can come and really participate in the gospel. And I've, I've always been a kind of a pure religion person where, you know, it's the really the things that Christ teaches that can help us in our day-to-day -day lives that matter most to me. I think, you know, where we get and what heaven we go to and, and such is, is something to strive for, um, but the gospel really has an impact in our day-to-day -day lives and how we treat people and how we learn from each other. Um, 
really the way that Christ did is most important. So one of the things we started with was just asking people to really be their true selves and really um, be open about the challenges they're facing and the things that they're struggling with, because we're all struggling with something, honestly. And sometimes it's one thing and sometimes it's another. And, and when we share those things, uh, it makes our ability to connect to each other stronger and also learn from each other in ways where if we just say, oh, everything's good and you know, uh, we can be a little bit better, it becomes very surface and shallow. So we've had some really great talks. People have come and shared their experiences coming from the LGBT community or as allies and being very open about it. And also some things that are you know, unrelated, but, but very um, compelling and, and teaching. We had a couple recently came and gave a uh, spoken sacrament where young couple, and you might expect, you know, they came from BYU and they just had this uh, great life, but they shared some very open and raw things that uh, were struggling. And, and we all came away like with a new appreciation of and the things that they'd gone through and uh, learned from that I, I think many people probably have had maybe not quite so similar experience, but uh, similar experiences that, that we can share and learn from. And so I've often heard now that people feel like we can kind of be real with each other in our sacrament meetings, which is a very open thing, but also in our Relief Society and Priesthood and Sunday School lessons, where it's a little bit more intimate groups um, and those conversations can be had in ways that Hopefully we can teach each other. We have uh, many members of the ward that are openly LGBTQ and, and share their experiences and feelings along the way. And um, I think we all learn and, and grow from that and we appreciate it. It's a, a beautiful thing in the church that we go to church with the people that we live around instead of going and finding like which ward that we feel like most suits us or you know, shop, shop for a congregation as some churches do. And it makes it so that we just, we get grouped with the people around us and we, you know, that uh, sometimes conflict, but also great social experiences and ministering of the people that may not be like us or we may not have chosen to be around necessarily, um, but we all become better for it. And uh, I think that's one of the geniuses of the, the wards in the church. Um, I think about kind of the bounds that I can work in to, to have and make change in our ward and, and in our, our congregation to focus on the gospel and not as much on some of the trappings of uh, just the, um, the way that the church is run. Uh, I've learned from our state president quite a bit. He was the bishop in this ward before I was. And uh, he also thinks the same way as Brown mentioned about ministering broadly and spending time as a, a state council on how do we minister and how do we learn from each other and more deep and not superficial ways. And so one of the things he did, and I don't know where he learned it from, was to have uh, call a sister to be in charge and, and think about the sacrament meeting topics and then actually invite people to speak. It's something that traditionally the bishoprics done as a, uh, I guess, a you know, quote unquote priesthood thing, but a place where within the bounds of the, the handbook that we're able to work with, you know, we're able to push and invite kind of more broad and open uh, our uh, our meetings to more inputs, right? And so we have a, a sister in our ward that does amazing things. She spends a lot of time in prayer on it um, and gives a unique viewpoint and input to our topics for our meetings and then who gets called to speak in ways that I think otherwise wouldn't. And then the last is, and just working locally. Um, you know, I heard the phrase before, think globally, but act locally. And I think as our ward, there's ways that we can think globally in the church about how we can help people learn and, and hopefully gain more understanding and appreciation and openness about many of the things that we're dealing with. Uh, but really the work we can do is within our own sphere. And so I think about you know, what, do we, what can we do in the, in the Bay Ward and in the San Francisco Stake to teach people and, and learn from each other and create that openness. Uh, but I'm not gonna be able to change or you know, affect stakes or, or wards in other places, except that uh, President, Nelson gave us a, a fireside to California a few months ago, and it was unique, and maybe he's done this for other places, but he, he felt the need to come and talk to just our, the saints in California. And the message I really took away was that it's a place that uh, people come for a time and then go lots of other places and take the things that, that we learn from each other and go take it and kind of seed into other parts of the world. And so, um, you know, it's 
place where people come, especially in our ward, where they're quite young and get a chance to come and learn how the church works and how the gospel works. And then they'll go somewhere else and take that uh, with them and, and hopefully learn and be able to, to share some of that experience they've had working closely with people in the LGBT community and uh, friends and experiences they've had and share that with the people around them as they go other places. We've had a few friends that have already done that, moved to Lehigh, Utah, and was asked by the state presidency to come and kind of share his experiences and suggestions for, for how they could make their state more open and, and welcoming. I know uh, we have the good friends, Geddes and Jill, that uh, came with, with a lot of that and taught us actually, um, but have gone other places too and, and taken their experiences here with them as, as well. And so I think appreciate being part of this group and learning and, and uh, appreciating all the things that we've learned from being part of it and the openness and the realness and those kind of same things that I hope that we can have as a ward in the, in the Bay Ward. Uh, but learning from, from this group, doing it first in a very, very focused and, and open way. So uh, yeah, leave that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, amen. thank you so much. It's really great to hear how there's just so many different experiences across the country in different wards. And I love how you said that um, when you became the Bishop of the Bay Ward, you kind of walked into something that was already established, like the inclusiveness there. And it was just a legacy that you were like continuing on. And I really love that idea. And the other, th the other idea that I like that you shared is, you know, you have people that will experience how the inclusive, how inclusive the wards are there in San Francisco, and then they'll move. And then, you know, inevitably they move into a ward that's less inclusive, but they have different experience and different things that they can bring. That, I mean, that gives me a lot of hope. Sometimes it's hard to be in Utah and hear some of the stories that happen here. Um, but really this is like a global church and our, our doctrine should really be more, you know, consistent across the nation. It shouldn't be so varied depending on the politics of each state, you know, that's just not how the church is created. So um, I did, if anyone has any questions, you can start to think of your questions. I did just want to share a thought. Um, I went to a fireside with Ben Shalati this weekend and somebody asked him, um, and this just really stood out to me and I wanted to share it with all of you, but um, somebody asked him if there was anything in the church that you could change, what would it be? Or what would you tell the church leaders to change to make the church more inclusive? And he said something that surprised me. He said, I would tell them that we need to do what the church has already said. And then he gave quotes. He gave a quote, the quote from Elder Ballard, where he said, um, we need to listen to and understand what our LGBTQ brothers and sisters are feeling and experiencing. And then the other quote was uh, from Elder Cook, let us be at the forefront in terms of expressing love, compassion, and outreach. Let's not have families exclude or be disrespectful of those who choose a different lifestyle as a result of their feelings about their own gender. And so these are things that the church has already said. And so basically Ben's point was, so if you're not at the forefront, then you're not already doing what the church has said. And for, you know, it was just weird to hear that, like, oh, we should be at the forefront of being, of being inclusive. And, and if we're not doing that, then we're not really following what the church leaders have said. I don't think a lot of people hear it that way, you know? So that was just something I wanted to share with you all. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the things that Alan and Brianna have shared with us tonight? You can put it in the chat if you want me to read it, or you can unmute yourself and just talk. Um, I just want to say that I think it's awesome to be that you guys are in a such a diverse ward, and it sounds like everyone is authentic and kind of feels like they can be their authentic selves because it's not cookie cutter and so everybody just doesn't expect to be a certain way and I think that's the problem is that 
everybody expects everybody in the ward to be a cookie cutter Mormon, you know, the same. But if we are more authentic and share more of our lives with each other and just be honest, um, there's so much more growth and love and ministering that we can do in our wards. Yeah, thank you. And I, I won't say that we're perfect at it. You know, I think we're still learning and growing all together. But that's a powerful thing. Yeah. Would you say that you have a like a higher than average percentage of LGBTQ people in your ward and stake? Well, that are open, I would say. Okay, so maybe more that are just out and you know open about it. Um, yeah, well, I'm, and also just from the area we live in, but I don't know uh, what other wards experience, and so it'd be hard <laughs> to compare. <laughs> well, I, I think I might be one of two queer people in my ward, but I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> I'm sure there's more, but we, you know, we don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I estimate there's probably 12 12 LGBTQ, LGBTQ persons in each ward, whether they're out or not. Statistically. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. I think in our ward, we have a, a great deal that are inactive, um, yeah. but are starting to get at least touched in some way by people in our ward. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question. Do you have any tips for managing those difficult moments when somebody says something that might be hurtful in a church meeting or someone who is not comfortable with um, embracing belonging and inclusion for LGBTQ folks in the ward? Maybe those people don't exist in San Francisco wards. I don't know, <laughs> but just wondering if you've had if you have any tips or experiences around that. Well, they may also just not be as open about it either. I guess. Yeah. It's just right. okay. You know, I'd rather they maybe not say those hurtful things openly, um, but to learn from each other. That's a good question. Do you have any? Um. Yeah, we've surprisingly had some people end up in tears um, for on all sides of topics, I think, because they haven't learned that it's just OK to have different opinions. Um, but as far as something negative that's actually said, uh, one of the most powerful things I learned from pharmacy school was to like make an empathetic statement first, because we're you can imagine like working in a Walgreens and someone can't get their medicine and they're just, people can get pretty angry and you try to deescalate. So the first step was to make an empathetic statement. So I think um, making an empathetic statement toward whoever said that, like, I can understand we have different perspectives, but um, we're really about supporting our individual members here and being kind hearted and then making a way to have them save face because it, you don't want people to leave the church because now they're seen a certain way. So emphasizing that we're all learning and growing and we're going to come to new spots and maybe suggest that even if it's not in that moment, but I know an amazing lady who could run a, a ward or stake entirely by herself and her method is to always grab like if if someone needs attention you grab another person to come with you and and do that so in that case if there was actually animosity toward two people deeply that as long as there's some chance to truly get to know somebody in a different setting whether it's like going out to lunch that feels a little less um risky then I, I think there's common ground. It's just more about finding common ground and learning to love people, I would say. And it probably just takes more exposure to that person even to 
kind of understand who they are as a person rather than just what your differences are. I don't know. It's my Thanks. thought. Beautiful. Yeah, I think we as a society right now are kind of all learning how to handle conflict better. You know, there's a lot of, um, I, I love the access that we have to like podcasts and, and um, the internet and different things to give us resources. But a lot of people are trying to learn like how to have productive disagreements, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that, that goes within our church as well. I think hopefully we'll get better at it. I guess one more thing I'd say is um, just in traveling to different places, not even in a church context, but I, I feel like my heart has been turned where you might perceive people have certain perceptions, but it's more just because they haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to enough people who are different um, than they personally are, or the group of people are that they live around. And, and so I think in those situations, it, it does just take more time of connecting if that can be facilitated in a, you know, casual way so that we just see each other more as people, which we are, and we have a lot of common ground. We all want to be loved and we all want easier lives and more money and, you know, very basic things. And you can definitely find unity in that. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? You can also share something just that you've been thinking about. We have about 10 more minutes. So I love just discussing ideas with this is kind of a group. Another thing Ben said at the fireside, um, somebody asked him like how he handles it when he feels like he doesn't belong or if someone makes him feel like he doesn't belong. And I, his confidence was a little confusing to me, but I guess he had great parents. <laughs> Because most queer people don't have that kind of confidence, except for Valerie walking into a ward. <laughs> but um, he just, I love, he said, he, I always go back to 1 Corinthians where it talks about the body of Christ. And I think to myself, like, all parts of the body are needed in order for Zion to be built and in order for the church to be whole. And nobody else is the same toe on the foot that I am. So they can't live without me. Like I, it, I can do something that no other part of the body of Christ can do. That was kind of his answer. He said, so what I do is I think, what can I do that no one else can do? And then I start doing that. So I really liked that flip because when you feel like you don't belong, you feel like you're just so different. You're so different. You're so far on the outside compared to everyone else. And he twisted that into, well, I can do, I can do things no one else can do. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to contribute. And someone like Ben, like he goes around contributing and it's hard for people to deny his help, you know? So he's like made a space for himself and he still gets a lot of persecution, you know, unfortunately. But um, I don't know. I think if we, I mean, I know Marin and I have talked about this. I know that a lot of us have just received the prompting, just be open, just go to church, just show up, just be who you are. And um, obviously, if every LGBTQ person could do that in their ward, there would be a huge shift. But I've been trying to do that for months in my ward, and it is so dang hard. <laughs> you can like, you know, I went to lunch with a woman this week and told her, and she's in my ward, and it was great. But it's just like little by little, one, one person at a time. And I don't know, it's hard to just show up and make comments about being gay at church. <laughs> but I don't know. Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah, and I'd, I'd certainly be interested to hear thoughts too about you know, what are things that you wish your bishop knew or that would you know, uh, be helpful as coming into a ward? You know, my for a testimony meeting on Sunday, um, we've talked about how 
the term same sex attraction was very was pretty much the only word that was allowed to be used in church for a long time talking about this. And then it kind of shifted to LGBTQ, which is nice. It's nice to hear, you know, them say LGBTQ over the pulpit. It feels a little more inclusive. But on Sunday, my uh, opening testimony meeting, one of the bishopric members bore their testimony and they use the words gay and bisexual. Like they literally said those words over the pulpit, which I haven't heard because usually they just stick to LGBTQ. And I don't know, just using those specific words and like be saying them in a room where you're like looking around, is anyone offended? Uh, to me, that just, it, op it opened up some space in that word to feel like, well, if they can say it, I can say it. If they can say gay over the pulpit, I can say gay over the pulpit, you know? Just that kind of example from allies, it helps me to feel a little more comfortable. That's fantastic. Also pro using pronouns like we and us, it um, helps it just to be us. You know, there's lots of ways in which we differ besides gender or sexuality. And so the, this is just, we as a ward, you know. And um, I had an experience yesterday. So the last Emmaus thing Sietzka had sent out or post on Facebook or something like that, you know, invite, invite your leaders. So I did. And um, only my Relief Society president was able to come, but all of them responded well. And my state president asked um, if he could get the recording of the meeting. And so then I sent him back in March or something. We had one where a stake talked about what they had done and there was a bunch of information about what they'd done. So I sent that to him. And yesterday when he was visiting our ward, he asked just to speak to me. And he just wanted ideas like, how can we make it more welcoming? And that was wonderful. It was a great conversation. Yeah, it was. That makes me so happy. <laughs> and so all I did was say, hey, we're having this fireside. Do you want to come? <laughs> so. I just got the last devotional recording. And I'll mm -hmm. be getting it ready for access for too long. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I love that we're recording these because you can refer people back. Like we had one with a transgender woman. We had um, like spouses and family members of LGBTQ people. So I feel like it's nice to have specific ones that you can, they're all on YouTube on our channel. And then I don't know where else we have them. That's probably the best place to find them. But you can go back and look for something specific if you're wanting to share like a specific area of LGBTQ inclusion with your leaders. I think that's, important to I think about um, it's not just one leader but it's all the leaders in the, the ward that set that tone so it's really cool to hear about everybody being open to coming and learning yeah I, I sent it to my bishop my Relief Society president the young women's president the state president they all responded positively so. That's great to hear. I, I think I've told a few people here, but my bishop is, um, he wants to be more inclusive, but he also said to me, it's, it's gonna create division in our ward because we have a huge group of allies and a huge group of, you know, more, I guess, homophobic people, you know? And so he's like, I know it'll create tension, but he wants to, engage in that discussion. So pretty brave of him. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming and uh, discussing and thank, thank you to the Carols for sharing your wisdom and experiences with us. I love hearing your backgrounds too and how that's influenced you as people and how it's influenced your growth. Um, I did want to say 
we are having a devotional in our next devotional is going to be like a combined holiday devotional. We're going to do it. I think December 11th is the date that we're going to stick with. Um, but what, what I wanted to do was to have submissions from Emmaus members, um, either if they're musical, they could submit a musical recording of either a song they wrote or just a song they like. Um, and then I also, we're gonna, I, I want people in the group to share spiritual thoughts. It could be around Christmas or Thanksgiving thoughts or just anything that's on your mind lately, but we would love to have just kind of short little thoughts mixed with music from our members. So if any of you want to participate in that, we would love it and go ahead and just message um, any one of us on the board if you wanna participate. And I think that's all. Do we have any other? I don't think we have any other things coming up until next family home evening. So everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And as always, if you ever have anything you want to share or post on the Emmaus website, go ahead and submit them and we can get them posted on the Facebook page. Would anyone like to offer a closing prayer for this meeting? I'm happy to do it. Thanks, Erica. Oh. Our dear Heavenly Parents, we're so grateful that we could gather together this evening from all across the country to be with each other and share the spirit of Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for the carols and the example that they are and that they could spend time with us sharing their experience. And we ask thee to bless those of us who are, who are allies to continue to listen and be there to support our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. And we're so grateful for the diversity that exists within your creation because it makes us, it enriches our lives and brings us closer to Jesus Christ. Please bless us this evening. And especially through this um, holiday season, as we are with family, bless, um, bless us that we can have uplifting times with family and that we can in particular be on the lookout for those who need family at this time. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thanks, Erica. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, have a wonderful so week. Thank you.